All right, back again with some more uh, questions that have to deal with some appropriate definitions, and uh, we'll see later some substitutions. Let's go ahead and dive in. So what we have here is an infinitely long cylindrical tube of radius A moves at a constant speed V along its axis. Okay. So it carries a net charge per unit length, lambda, uniformly distributed over its surface. Okay. Surrounding it at radius B is another cylinder moving at the same velocity but carrying the opposite charge. Okay, negative lambda. So what we want to find is the energy per unit length stored in the fields. Okay, notice it's stored in the fields. B, the momentum per unit length in the fields. Okay, again, notice in the fields. And the energy per unit time transported by the fields across the plane perpendicular to the cylinders. All right, bunch of things to deal with the fields themselves. Let's dive in and be very careful how we apply this. Um, seems that here, the location of these things is definitely going to matter. So let's be careful because of things like Gauss's law and the fields, all that kind of stuff. All right. So the charges slash currents inside the inner cylinder, S equal A, and outside cancel, okay? Because if we have nothing in, so on the inside we have zero. So Gauss's law gives us zero field there. And on the outside, the total charge included would be plus lambda, minus lambda. They cancel to zero, so the fields cancel. Cool. Um, we like that. Um, similarly for the B, if we did an Empyrean loop, they would cancel in uh, directionality. So good to go there. Um, but now in between, we definitely have something to worry about. So let's go ahead and look there. So we're only concerned with the fields in between the cylinders, i.e. S between A to B. Okay, with that, Gauss's law says that we only have, um, it, the Q enclosed would be a 2 pi um, S for the cylinder times H, whatever. Do the Gauss's law on it, not that big a deal. But you see that E is equal to 1 over 2 pi epsilon naught, um, sig or positive lambda, since that's the inside enclosed charge over S in the S hat direction. Similarly, B is equal to mu naught 2 pi times I over S, I here, however, is represented by the charge moving, so that's lambda times V. Okay, so a nice little twist there. All right, now that we have that, let's dive into part A. The total energy stored, uh, this is a density, of course, is little u is equal to 1 half epsilon naught e squared plus uh, 1 over mu naught b squared. Now let's recall that the squares are representative of the dot products. So this is e dot e and b dot b, and since they're dot products with themselves, all it is is the magnitude squared. All right, so we have that here. We see we got a bunch of cancellations. The epsilon naught cancels with the factor, and the mu naughts cancel with the factor. Both terms have a 2 pi squared, so they pull them out. So 2 pi squared is 4 pi squared times the factor of 1 half, because it's 8 pi squared. Uh, let's see. And then we put in a factor of epsilon uh, into the magnetic field part of it, so we could factor out the epsilon in the uh, electric field part of it, and both of them have lambda squared, so good there. Uh, both of them have it 1 over s squared, so we're cool there. Now let's note here, and I think we do it in the next step. Oh, we don't. Okay. Um, but anyways, after we're factoring and simplifying this down, we can uh, see that we have lambda squared over 8 pi squared epsilon, bracket 1 plus epsilon naught mu naught v squared. Now remember how epsilon naught times mu naught relates to the speed of light. And then times 1 over s squared. And the reason why I set it up this way is if we integrate over the volume between the cylinders, you know, this is from negative z to z, whatever that is, since we're running along the axis, it could be negative infinity to infinity, whatever. And then 0 to 2 pi, so we get the uh, uh, azimuthal angle, and then 0 to a, or excuse me, a to b, since that's a radius region of interest. And then our, since we want the work uh, per unit length, L, we just have the integral of U over L. So that's where we get the 1 over L. And then, uh, yeah, just cancel it through. Or, and then just cancel or segment it through. You see that a factor of S cancels immediately. Pull out all the constants to the right. Split up the integrals, thanks to Fabini. You get the Z integral, the phi integral, and the S integral. All pretty easy to deal with. Um... You see that the delta L, or the, uh, rather, when we get Z minus negative Z, that, or delta Z, whatever that is, we're going to call that L for some unit length, 
and hence the little L cursive L and time, or excuse me, the L from the Z integral and the one over L cancel. So we did that on purpose. The phi integral gives us two pi. So that cancels with a factor of pi and the eight reduces to a four. And then we're left with ln of b over a, thanks to the log rules. So we'll go ahead and tidy this up. Now we get one more step of simplification, and we see that the um, we see that uh, epsilon naught mu naught is equal to one over c squared. Okay, so we factor that in, and we see that we have the ratio of the speed of light with the speed of these moving cylinders. Okay, so that should be not alarming, but definitely cool to see, and we'll see it again later. All right, so now that we have that, uh, similarly, the momentum per unit length is, well, take the cross product of the fields. Again, you see the epsilon cancel immediately for the ease. Pull out all the constants. You see we have um, S cross phi gives a Z. You see we have, uh, and then the constant simplified to mu naught 4 pi squared over lambda squared V over S squared. Again, since we're looking per unit length, since these are infinite cylinders, we get uh, bold P over little L. Again, go ahead and plug it through the integrals uh, since we found G, which is the momentum density, linear momentum density. Plug it on through, you get the same thing. Um, you see the L and L cancels from the Z integral. You get a two pi from the phi, and again, you get the natural log of B minus A. A whole lot of cancelizing or canceling. And we're left with uh, P over L is equal to mu naught uh, lambda squared v over 2 pi l and b over a in the z at direction and then of course finally what we see here is that the pointing vector z cross b uh which we found was or rather we saw that uh e cross b was equal to uh g over epsilon naught so we factor that in um not not the exact way it was written but algebraically solved good to go whatever um so what we do that we do that since we already found g and what we notice is that we have an epsilon and a mu naught, and that's equal to 1 over c squared, so plug that in, and you divide by a fraction, you multiply by the reciprocal, so you get c squared g. All right, cool. Now, we know that power, which is related to uh, the change in work or the change in time, but that's also equal to the integral of the pointing vector over some differential area. So we plug that in, we get c squared uh, g dot da, but we know that g... The area in a rule of uh, g dot da is equal to L times the um, momentum per unit length, since we already did the integral of g. Um, so now we just need to times it by the uh, length, uh, since our da is perpendicular. And uh, you see those cancel, and we're left with uh, p, c squared p, and we found, c, uh, excuse me, we found p the step before it. So we see again that dw dt is equal to mu naught, uh, lambda squared c squared v over 2 pi ln of b over a. Isn't it fascinating how all these things seem to just work out together like this? It is really cool, and the interplay of them would definitely be used and abused in coming chapters, so be aware.